Um, welcome, Shelcon. Uh, we're going to talk. Tell me where you are. A case study of GPS tracker security with Martin Brom. We're on track B, 1400 to 1450. Um, Martin is a security researcher with Avast. He leads research across various disciplines such as dynamic binary translation, hardware assisted virtualization, IoT, firmware vulnerabilities, and malware analysis. Well. Okay, so welcome everybody to this talk. Uh, actually, this is kind of a a uh, little bit of a hobby project because I was asked by one of my colleagues to, to check if his tracker is secure and it turned out uh, into a Mindham and uh, I would say uh, really bad uh, outcome about the security of GPS trackers altogether. So as a preface, I will be probably denied uh, uh, visa to China after this talk because you will see. So I think in the course of history, uh, our planet shaped several important events, right? Like a big flood, as it is eruption. And most recently, we came into the age of IoT devices. So let's, let's talk a bit about the security of IoT devices. What is the state of the security of IoT devices, right? Uh, we all know that it's not good. And I would like to show you this uh, favorite movie, movie or a clip from a movie. I don't know if you know the space balls. Okay, so is it that bad? Actually, this whole talk about the GPS trackers uh, will be about the combination one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, when we're speaking about IoT devices, we have like several problems with IoT uh, devices altogether nowadays. Uh, one of them is so-called out-of-the-box problem. It basically means that many of IoT devices uh, come pre-configured uh, with the preset password, with default configuration, and they don't require any configuration from the user. So if they don't require the configuration, they usually stay with the default one, which is not secure. So we all know the default passwords to routers and various different devices. So that's the out of the pro box problem. The second one uh, is about outdated protocols, and very often we see in IoT devices protocols that, um, that have no encryption at all, um, no, that there is basically no security. They are using often a plain text uh, while communicating with the cloud infrastructure, for example, which is kind of ridiculous. It's like uh, accessing your banking account using a telnet. And that's exactly what these devices are doing, right? And the pr third problem is the problem of volume. Uh, it turned out that by 2020, there are supposed to be around 38 billion of IoT devices and approximately 95% of all devices connected to the internet will be IoT devices. So today's computers, mobile devices will be only 5% of all devices connected to the internet, which is a huge problem if you think if you are thinking about the security and or the state sec of the security of IoT devices nowadays. So <clears throat> I, went with the, I learned this, uh, uh, this symbol, which is the symbol of the Holy Trinity. And it perfectly fits to IoT 
infrastructure nowadays. The common IoT infrastructures and uh, infrastructures for IoT devices looks like this, right? So we have usually a device, then the application, the company and application which controls the device, and then a cloud, and the whole thing basically makes the IoT, devices uh, IoT device itself. So when we are speaking about how to approach the security assessment of IoT device, uh, I came with this simple recipe, which basically consists of these steps. First, you need to get to know the device, the specifications, the protocols uh, being used, and the application itself. Then, you need to identify all data flows between these components. Usually, which is uh, because we are lazy, right? Uh, we start with the least effort approach, so do the easiest thing first. Then, uh, hardware reversing is usually the last option to go, but sometimes it's very helpful. And very often, the first thing to look into uh, is a company and application itself, because it's usually easy to de decompile the Android application, to reverse engineer it, and to get to know how the device communicates uh, with the cloud. So let's speak about the GPS trackers. Uh, these devices are often targeted at children, older pe people, uh, pets, cars, and are being marketed as uh, devices that bring peace of mind. Uh, in fact, it's not true. It's basically bringing a hell into your life. And I'll show you why. This is how the majority of GPS trackers work. So usually you have a cloud which resides on some server, usually on AV, uh, AWS. Uh, then you have some web application, some interface. Uh, then the application on a mobile device, the company application which talks to a cloud and usually, some, uh, usually also through a GSM provider using, for example, SMS messages to a tracker itself. Tracker itself consumes the, uh, the coordinates from the GPS system and using the mobile uh, network, uh, using the SMS messages or GPRS transfer of a data to a cloud. So this is the general structure of how this works. The tracker itself usually consists of some uh, system of chip uh, and then few modules, usually two modules, the GPRS mod these, are, these are usually uh, distinct components, so it's not uh, in, in one uh, package. So you usually inside the tracker you find the GPRS modem and the GSM module. And these two modules communicate with this uh, system on chip or with the main component, in main CPU using a serial bus. So let's have a look uh, on one particular example of a GPS tracker, which you can buy uh, on eBay, for example. It's this tracker, it's called T8 Mini GPS Tracker Locator. It's not that cheap to like $43, it's not that cheap. Uh, if you think, or if you will see that the security is not really very good of the tracker, so for that price, I think it's overpriced. So the onboarding process of the whole tracker. Uh, when you take out the tracker out of a box, there is a leaflet which states this. Uh, you use as a username or for a first login into a web application, you have to use the ID which is a part of a, of a email uh, number of the tracker. And yeah, so that's, that's basically it. And when you first reach out to a web page or to an application, the preset password is one, two, three, four, five, six. What is even more interesting is this sentence, which says, basically it says that you can't create your own account. So you have to use uh, as a login or as a username uh, the ID uh, the only thing you can change is the password, but guess what? Nobody really does that. 
when we're speaking about the communication between the web application and the cloud, uh, it goes like the interface itself is hosted on uh, HTTP, so it's not secure. So everything you type in to these login fields uh, basically travels plain text over, over the internet. When you first log in into the interface, it looks like this. This is the close-up. So you can, you can see that the device itself is identified by the portion of the email number and uh, you can basically issue various commands to a device directly from the interface. You can, for example, send a firmware update through one click of a button. So you can basically replace the firmware in a device. You can remotely reset the device. You can uh, turn the device into a monitoring mode. In that case, the device itself uh, itself calls to a different number and basically you'll get the full audio of a victim without like the victim even know that that it's connected to someone else's phone. You can also send SMS messages using the tracker and various other, other things uh, which I'll show you in a demo. So the tracker inside uh, is identified by the email and the ID. As I said before, the ID is portion of the email. So you can see this is the standard format of the email number, which consists of 15 digits. The last one is the so-called control digit. Uh, the first one is TAC, which you can think of it as a, as a prefix of a MAC address. So it's basically assigned to a vendor and to a specific product. So they, that means that for a serial number of the device, there is only six digits to go through. So if you are an attacker, it's very, and you know that most of these devices have one, two, three, four, five, six as a password, you can easily iterate through all the serial, all the serial numbers of the devices and, and basically connect or lock into any of the accounts, which is all, what is also very interesting is that these uh, numbers and passwords or the accounts in the cloud are assigned to a device even if the device is still um, in a, some, somewhere uh, on a shelf uh, in stock, stock. So you can basically change the password before the device uh, reaches the user. So as I said, this is our ID and it maps to, uh, to MAS like this. So there is the prefix, four digit prefix, which stays the same, and then the six digits of a serial number. Uh, when you, we are going to use the standard tools all the time. So when you use the developer, uh, developer tools in Chrome, you can easily get uh, the flow of the data between the cloud and, and the application, the web application. So you can see uh, just after the logon, uh, the web page asks for devices assigned to a specific user. Uh, in a close up, it looks like this. The protocol is, as I said, over HTTP. Uh, so you can in plain text see JSON uh, request and also the response. So uh, you see that the user ID is 6663 and the device ID is six digits after the login, which is 721911. So the application with the cloud, in this case, it's an Android application, uh, looks like this uh, for this particular tracker. Uh, as you see here, again, you need to uh, use the device ID and the password uh, for login, so it's the same same uh, system or same thing as with the uh, with the web application. And if we look into what's going on between the application and the cloud, it again it again goes unencrypted over HTTP. Uh, you can see that the endpoint for the whole uh, API is Open API v3 as a mix. Somewhere here, let me somewhere 
here. So this is, this is the endpoint for the whole IP, API. And if you look at the request, it's pretty simple. It contains basically the login app, which is the identification, uh, which is the identification of the application itself. Uh, then the login type, which is either one or two, uh, based on if you choose the login using the ID or a username. But because you can't create a username, you have to go with the one always. Login type, then the password, uh, and the key, which is basically generated key, and it's fixed for each version of the Android application. So it's always the same, same number. So that's the, that's the whole login request. So if we do a proper, th this was, um, this was uh, output from our tool, which is called IPKLab.io. Uh, I can show you <coughs> this, this tool after the talk. It's basically, uh, it's basically threat intelligence platform for, for Android applications. Uh, it's free, it's in a beta. And we are giving, if you are interested as a researcher, we are giving um, the accounts for free. Just, just uh, if you have interest in it, uh, we can create you an account. So when we do a proper sniffing of the traffic, uh, we see the whole, uh, the whole flow of data between the application. And the cloud, uh, again, it uses POST, open API v3 SMX, uh, and various commands such as get device status, uh, login, get tracking, and so on. So we, if we take one of these requests, uh, you can see that basically parameters go as a H, HTTP form or HTML form and for, this is the login, Log, uh, login, yeah, this is the uh, login function, uh, which takes the name of the application, the password, and the ID, which is under name, then GMT zone, but you can basically type there anything you want, it really doesn't matter, and, and the, the key for the application itself. So this is the login. The response then is uh, very simple. Uh, you see the type of the device, which in this case is T8S. Uh, the serial number, which is the part of the email, and the session key, which is this one. This session key you should use for any other requests uh, into the API. But the truth is there are older version of this API that basically don't require this session key. And unfortunately, these older version of API uh, running on the same server uh, with the API version three. So if you basically down roll, downgrade to API version two, you don't even need to provide the session key, which basically means you don't have to log in at all. So this is the, uh, this is the comment for, uh, for get tracking info, which basically returns the coordinates, last coordinates of the tracker. Again, get tracking keyword. Uh, the input parameters are pretty simple. So we see the device ID again, uh, and the map type you want to get uh, the coordinates uh, relative to, and the session key in this, key, uh, in this case, because it's a version three of the API, which requires the session key. And the response, again, pretty simple JSON. Uh, you can see the coordinates here. Uh, eventually speed first, if, if the tracker is on a, uh, if in a stop mode, which basically means it, it didn't move. And yeah, and the status of battery. When we use the APK lab IO, which as I said, it's a threat intelligence tool we use for mobile application. We found out that there are 48 different Android applications that share, basically th this uh, listing is made based on that, um, uh, on that AP uh, app key, 
which is constant for all the all the applications that are using the same cloud. So you can you can see there is like 48 applications which uses the same uh, the same infrastructure and that have the same issues. When we speaking of the communication between the tracker itself and the cloud infrastructure, uh, it's even worse uh, than in a case of the Android application. Uh, the question here is how to sniff the traffic between the tracker and the cloud because everything goes through a GSM or GPRS. You have several options. Obviously, you can build your own BTS station, which is viable, but it's a bit complicated. As in, it's turned out in this case, it's not needed. It's very easy to intercept the traffic inside the tracker itself. Because as I said, uh, it's like th three distinct components inside the tracker. So you can easily tap and there are, there are like a testing pads already in a tracker that you can use to tap into the communication between the main CPU and the GPRS modem. And in that case, you see all the AT commands with all the data that are passing through, through the uh, bus, which was pretty easy. And we did that like 10 minutes exercise you see there are two uh, sets of pads for for uh, probing one is between the uh, GSM modem and the or GPRS modem and the other set is for uh, for uh, GPS module it turned out that the, the traffic is obviously plain text and it turned out that you don't even have to do that because if you take out the leaflet for that particular tracker, there is a special command you can issue to a tracker using a SMS. So you can basically the tracker, you can set up the tracker using SMS messages. And one of these setup message allows you to set up the IP address and the port to which the tracker sends all the data. And it's protected by a password, which is surprise, one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's another set of, let's say, passwords, which is set in, inside the tracker itself. So we did, and it was pretty easy to get all the data because using the SMS, we rerouted all the traffic through our proxy server and get all the data that went through. And this is the outcome. You can see the command or the data from a tracker to a cloud are, again, plain text, you can see here uh, the model number. This is the ID of the tracker. And then data of a comment, in this case, uh, it's GPS coordinates. So this is the breakdown. Uh, the format is like this. There's a model, the email ID, then the size of the comment and the comment itself. So this comment, for example, uh, allows the cloud to tell the tracker to switch into a monitor mode and to call an arbitrary number uh, which you can put into, into the message. And if you look carefully, you probably don't see any password or authorization at all. The only thing that identifies the tracker itself is the ID. So that means because you can reroute the traffic, the traffic goes unencrypted, that you can even easily spoof the location and all the data that goes from a tracker using a simple script and sending. Basically, you can, you can uh, make, uh, feel the user that, that the tracker is on different coordinations or, or in different state because you can really spoof anything you want to. The scary stuff here is the volume uh, and the attack vectors you can you can issue or you can carry on in this case. We did a quick scan of one uh, million of devices belonging to this email prefix. There are much more prefixes than just this one. So we, we did basically just a scan of one million devices and it turned out that 200,000 devices is with the default password and 167,000 of these devices we, we, we were able to locate these devices because they, they, have, uh, they had coordinates stored. 
And we also identify that there is 29 different models of these trackers. And we look them up. So you can see all these trackers basically use, are using the same infrastructure and the same cloud. This is a map uh, because this, this one was, this particular one when there was a Chinese one, you can see that the most of the users are from from Europe and around the China, uh, not many users in, in US. And we analyze cloud uh, a little bit more because we were quite interesting into the, into the API that the cloud is using and what you can do with all these comments uh, of that API. And when we were searching through internet from, for open API v3, we found one particle server that had the browsing allowed so you can get all the files stored on the server very easily. You can, for example, see here uh, images because some of these trackers are, um, are basically like the watches with the camera. So you can take a picture with them. And it, these pictures are just stored here as a files. And it also uh, shows that there are like four different versions of API. Actually, there is uh, the new one is Open API v5. Uh, so we did a bit of experiments. We looked into the logged files, which was also pretty interesting. So the, these are the log files stored on that server. And if you looked into a log file, if you if you look into a log file, uh, there is an exception, right? And what was pretty interesting for us was the name of the binary, which basically does all the logic of the, of the infrastructure. So we run a simple query on Google for that binary. This is the close up. <laughs> and we found another server with the browsing allowed with exposed update for this infrastructure or for this server. So basically we got all the binaries uh, of the whole infrastructure. Using it, what, what's, what was pretty interesting for us, uh, except all these binaries are .NET binaries, was this particular one file, the send command API. And when we, when we uh, put that file into IDA, we got a list of all supported models of trackers and different formats of comments for trackers that this infrastructure supports. So at the end, it turned out that there are different manufacturers of trackers supported by this one particular vendor of, uh, of the software or of the cloud. So there are different versions, uh, different vendors of uh, hardware and one particle vendor of, of the cloud itself. And at the end, we came with the, these numbers. So there are approximately 500 models of GPS trackers uh, that are using this infrastructure and 30 plus clouds sharing the same API and the same issues. And when we look into an API, uh, it turned out that it's kind of self-documenting at some servers, basically when you type in the, the URL of the, of the API, it gives you this. And this is like an interactive tool you can use to issue various commands uh, of that API. And one very interesting API, API function is connected to these trackers with the cameras. And the API is called get device photo. The only thing you need to get a photo from a device using the API is the device ID. But the device ID itself is just a six digi digits long number. 
Uh, and basically the time zones, you can type anything you want into it. And the key is again, the, the hard coded key inside the APK or inside the mobile application. So using that, you can construct a very, very simple post request to a server and you'll get this response. So you'll, you'll get the list of all the images stored for that particular device ID. So again, because it's just six digits, you can easily scan through them in a matter of minutes and get all the pictures from all the devices. Okay, so let's have a look at some demo of the API. So this is the web application. I just quickly show you the login process. So if I type one, two, three, four, five, six, you can see live what I was talking about. Okay, unfortunately I, was, I wasn't able to get a SIM card that works with the tracker here in US. So the last a recorded position was in Athens in Greece. And the only thing you can do is change the password, which is here, but nobody really does that. And if you think about how the API is, is constructed, you don't really, uh, actually there, there is, uh, if you change the password, you can't uh, avoid like the attacker or hacker to, to get into your account very easily because usually the login is not required. So let's have a look at the API. So this is one, I'll try to make it bigger. So this is the open API v3. And if you look, for example, into a get device detail, you can see that it shares the same properties as the get uh, device photos. So the only thing you need is the device ID, which for my particular tracker, and th this, is, this is basically, th this is probably just the line inside the database or the ID in the database, so it won't change. So if, you, if you'll get this number, it stays uh, the same all the time, so you can put there anything you want. And this is one of these uh, keys from application. And you get, you'll get uh, the type of the model, uh, serial number, and various information. So it's as easy. What's Kind of interesting function here is obviously there, there is a get tracking which basically works the same. So you can type the device ID, uh, the model doesn't matter, time zone doesn't matter, map, map type could be Google or Baidu, uh, language it really doesn't matter, and the key, and you should get the last position recorded for the tracker. So you saw that I didn't do any login, so you really don't not need to log in to get all this data. But what is interesting and what I found recently, actually this morning when I was preparing this presentation is that you can, like, like I, was, I was thinking of like, how is it possible that you can create the username and the password or uh, because there are, there are like functions, for example, get user info or user detail, or is it get user info, which takes the user ID, which I don't have. But it turned out that you can get that user ID from the web application. So when you do the login using the, I'll go back to a presentation and I'll show you a 
at the beginning, there was the request. Okay, this will be probably faster. And this was the login request at the beginning of the web app application. Uh, or actually the response contained, where is it, here. Interestingly, the response contained the user ID, which normally if you use the login from the API, which, uses, which the Android application is using, you don't have this information. But when you use the web application, you'll get user ID, which is 6663. But I didn't create any user, right? So I was quite curious what I'll get if I put this user ID here. Using the same technique. I'll get this, which is kind of interesting because I didn't create this login name. Uh, I didn't put there this service phone. So what is this about? Actually, the answer is pretty terrifying. When you use the login form, and put there the number of the account and the password, which I won't tell you, you'll get this, which is the control panel of the vendor with all the trackers sold by the vendor, which allows you to charge the users, reset the passwords, locate all the trackers and all the devices, even export all the data into Excel. So that's how, the situation, how bad the situation is. And you can say that these are all like Chinese trackers and we don't really buy these here. But it turned out that some vendors, even in US, are selling pretty well, for example, this one. You can see that there is like pretty huge number of ratings. Uh, it looks pretty good. It's sold by a company called Prime Tracking. It seems to be a US company. When you download the application and then do the reverse engineering of the APK, you'll get into this. <laughs> So it's basically undercover because it's not called Open API V3. It's called Prime. Uh, you can't probably see it, but it's called Prime API. But you've probably already seen this. So it turn, like this research is ongoing, uh, and it seems that there are many of different vendors that are using the same infrastructure. And the culprit of all these uh, APIs and basically the software solution is one particular company in China, which is called Yaven IoT. And they even have a documentation of the whole infrastructure, supported trackers, you can find there even the protocol for different hardware vendors. So by using these informations, you can really rule the whole world of GPS trackers. Because everything is here. And even in the documentation, you can see that there is, there is really no security at all.
nothing. So that's it. Thank you for if you have any questions, just ask me. Uh, if you are interested in the APK Lab IO, it's pretty cool tool. It's online, and you can have uh, an account. Just write me your name and email, and we'll send you a, a key. Or you can you can just go to APK Lab IO, and I think there is a link which basically sends you to a form you have to fill in it for for account. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think I can show you. There are like two versions. There's the community version, which I offer, and then there is a version, like the internal version, with, which gives more data. But basically, if we go to APK Lab IO, uh, I can show you some tracker. So. You see the application, basically you have the static, fe static features of the application. Okay, this is not the right one. Uh, it does like the static analysis and the dynamic analysis as well. So it records all the network traffic, uh, all the API calls all the, uh, during the run of the process. So I'll take something more interesting. Yeah, you can you can upload your uh, own APK, or you can type there just SHA, and it downloads the the APK from the Google App Store. So you can you can use it both. So from dynamic features, which is mm, pretty much what what you are interested in, uh, you can, for example, see usage of crypto, there is none actually. And then the network dump, okay. I chose probably the bad application. Uh, entry points, files. Okay, I'll try, I'll try to show you something more interesting. For example, the one of these trackers. I fail, I think, was the name, yeah. Some dynamic features. Uh, are, if you are interested in like reverse engineering and anali dynamic analysis of uh, of Android, it supports also the Frida framework, so you can integrate like your own script scripts into it. And so I, I think there will be some network now definitely here. So you can see. You can see all the networks, and you can you can even download the uh, like the PCAT, so you can analyze it yourself if you wish. Uh, actually, uh, it works like like the SMS is basically uh, like the emergency channel for a communication. Uh, but you can you can like definitely issue a command to a tracker using a SMS to get uh, to get the location, for example. Uh, it should be protected by a password, but the password is one two three four five six on all the trackers or by, uh, by this particular vendor. Uh, we've seen also another vendor, and they are using, I think, 8765 as a password. But it's like the, the problem is it's a different password than to an account, and nobody really change, changes this, this password because it's on a tracker, and nobody really knows that they have to change the password on a tracker, on like the SMS side. And yeah, so you can, you can basically use the SMS to can to skip all the cloud and to, to control the tracker just via the SMSs.
not yet. Actually, I have one party, one, one tracker on my table right now, which uh, is, which is using uh, LTE, already, and you have to prepay, like you have uh, to pay the vendor to run, uh, you know, like the yeah, like the plan uh, connected to to LTE. But it uh, and it look, looked at the first side it looked pretty good because it uses HTTPS. But, but if you decry decrypt the HTTPS, if you tap into the HTTPS, it uses the same API. Just inside the HTTPS, but it doesn't matter because right there, it's not a. Yeah, HTTPS is secure, so there is there is no need to use anything else. And it's, it's being sold here in US as well. So, yeah, the problem is like these trackers are so, sold globally and are heavily white labeled. And I think the general problem with these devices, with these cheap Chinese devices, is that the, like the supply chain uh, of, of these like components and devices are like, like these supply chains are like really really hard to like, see through because it's so complex. Like, there are so many vendors like buying uh, parts of the solution from the others in China that it's really hard to, to get like insight into it. How, this, how does this work? And we are slowly getting there, but it's, it's a mess. I, especially in, in case of a GPS trackers, I was, I was really surprised how many of of these trackers are sharing the same same infrastructure, the same issues, the same same bugs and security issues. Uh, it's and they are even sold in Europe by European companies, but you know, like white labeled versions basically of these Chinese trackers. The same is happening here in US. Thank you for your attention.